Welcome to the final video of our five part series on plantar fasciitis. In part five, we're gonna explain why you're not getting better, the keys to your recovery, and our top exercises for proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. Hey, it's Glenn here from Mehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for educational and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. If you've not watched the first videos in this series, you should go back and watch those first for this to make sense. All tissue like muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, skin, etc. have a certain level of force that it can tolerate and will only get injured when you exceed its tolerance to force. That could be a one-time high force such as a fall or a car accident, or a low-level repetitive force such as an overuse injury. When tissue is damaged, its tolerance to forces is temporarily decreased. In this injured state, activities that would normally be tolerated now result in damage. Healing has essentially three phases. The first phase is the inflammatory phase. This phase typically lasts three to seven days, provided that the tissue is not re-injured. The cardinal sign of the inflammatory phase is constant symptoms. Inflammation is a chemical process, much like a fever, and that you can't turn it on and off. At any time, if you can get into a position, say sitting, and you have no symptoms, you can't be in the inflammatory phase. Once symptoms become intermittent, you are in the next phase called the reparative or proliferation stage. In this stage, the body is rebuilding the damaged structures and there will be no symptoms unless you exceed the tolerance of the repairing tissue. This is also the stage where most people get in trouble. Because there is no pain at rest or with very low level activities, people assume they are okay to resume normal activities. The problem is that the absence of pain at rest is no indication that the tissue is strong and can tolerate your normal activities. People try and return to normal activities which then damages the tissue and puts them back into the inflammatory phase. They take it easy for a few days and the symptoms get better, and then they try again, and around and around they go with periods of no symptoms and periods of pain. Unfortunately, it can be impossible to tell if you've overdone it until the next day, and because of this, slow and gradual progression of activity is required. A sudden increase in activity can easily overload the tissue and restart the process all over again. As time goes on, the injured tissue becomes stronger and stronger and thus more tolerant of forces, moving into the remodeling or maturation stage. During this phase, the collagen fibers that were laid down in a disorganized fashion are reorganized. Gradual and progressive loading helps this process, but the process takes time and requires consistency and a continued progression of forces. So what should you do and when? We have a plantar fasciitis program available at our website mehab.net but we're going to cover some of the important rules to follow and also give you a link to a special video on the top 10 things to know about recovering from a tendinopathy. So here are our top tips. Number one, deload or unload. If you have pain at rest, meaning it hurts all the time, not just some of the time, I mean all the time that you're awake, you must unload or deload your foot. It means you're in the inflammatory phase. The tissue has very poor tolerance to force. Even just standing could be too much force and cause more damage delaying recovery. Depending on the severity of the damage and the associated decrease in tissue tolerance, you may not be able to put any weight on the foot at all. Or maybe it'll be able to handle a little bit of stress and you could use crutches. It's going to vary from person to person. Only you have the ability to figure that out. It's hard and it sucks, especially if you're working or have other responsibilities. But it is crucial to give the tissue time to move through the phases of healing. Unload it. Don't stretch it. Don't rub it. Don't try and walk it out. Rest and unload until your symptoms become intermittent, meaning no pain at rest in an unloaded position. It will serve you so much better in the long run. Number two, be consistent. The key to achieving full recovery, as with any goal, is to stay consistent and work on it every day. Don't look for the quick fixes or a miracle pill or ointment. They are not supported by evidence. But if you are going to use them anyways, make sure they are a supplement to the meat and potatoes of your recovery, which is consistent and progressive loading. They should never be used as a replacement for the core work that is required. Number three, be patient. 
tendinopathies take a long time to become pain-free, with pain improving around 12 weeks and full recovery taking around 24 weeks, if it is loaded progressively and appropriately. If you were very active prior to injury, expect to have a slightly longer recovery. It takes more time to get your tissue to tolerate higher forces. The stress of walking to a mailbox is nothing compared to a marathon runner or a triple jumper. Logically, it will take more time to return to those activities. Without a doubt, you're going to get frustrated, but if you stick with it, you will recover. Number four, progress slowly. Don't rush your recovery or your return to your previous activities. If you try and return too fast, you will likely dump yourself back into the inflammatory stage and have to start all over again. Your body and tissue will tell you if you're progressing too fast. For example, if you walk for five minutes on one day, wait until the next day to see how you react. If your body can't tolerate the five minutes yet, it will be painful and sensitive the next day. So take the day off and make sure your symptoms are intermittent before trying again. Next time you try, try walking for three minutes. Wait and see how you feel the next day. As you progress slowly, your tissue will adapt and get more tolerant. Keep in mind that any stress placed on your foot is really an exercise and contributes to the daily cumulative amount. Be aware if you're tolerating 10 minutes of structured walking for four days straight, and then all of a sudden you get increased symptoms, it's likely to be something other than the walking that caused the flare. Maybe you carried something up and down the stairs or did some gardening, who knows, but think about any possible increased activity that you did the day before. Here are our top exercises. Ankle and toe pumps. Before you stand up either in the morning or after sitting, move your ankles and toes up and down 50 to 100 times or more. This will help get the tissue in your system ready to be active. The more active you can be before getting out of bed or getting up, the better. Do some exercises in bed before you put weight on your feet. Swing your arms, kick your legs, literally anything. Heel raises. Heel raises are the perfect exercise for recovery. They load the plantar muscles with the exact function that they perform during walking and running. Their intensity can be easily adjusted by switching between exercises in seated versus standing, two feet versus one foot, eccentric versus concentric focus, and even plyometrics. Stretching, but not your typical calf stretches, which are kind of pointless. They do put some small stress on the plantar intrinsic muscles, which is why they kind of work. In order to do them correctly, you need to have your toes extended while putting weight on your foot. Let me make it clear that you're not doing this to stretch those tissues. Placing weight on these muscles in this fashion is applying a tensile force. It is just another form of loading the structure. Walking is another perfect exercise where it replicates the function of the plantar intrinsic muscles and the intensity can be easily adjusted through the manipulation of duration and also incline. The key is to only increase duration every four to seven days to allow the tissue to adapt. If symptoms increase, wait until symptoms are intermittent and decrease your walking duration. So there we have it, our complete guide to plantar fasciitis, or as it likely should be called, a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. We hope you found the series valuable. If you did, please give us a like. We have a lot of great videos coming out, so please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you on the next one.